Okay, I think, uh, I think it's time to start. Welcome everyone. Welcome to the very last Hot Politics lab meeting of this academic year. Um, we have, uh, we're have we setting up an exciting program for next year, uh, but uh, almost everything is still to be announced. But I can already tell you um, August 28th will be the first Friday um, that we will start again with the next academic year. So mark your calendars. Um, before that, um, we have uh, our last meeting today with two presentations uh, by two PT students from the lab. Um, first, we'll have Tobias Rohrbach, who uh, is at the University of Fribourg in Switzerland, but doing a dual uh, uh, program. So he's also uh, um, um, he's also part of the um, University of Amsterdam PhD program, as uh, decided this week. Uh, but he's been working on uh, 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 on this this project for a while now, and um, he will talk about um, uh, the use of pink allowed protocols in uh, in studying uh, uh, gendered uh, decision making in 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 politics. Uh, so this is a this is a pre analysis plan, right, Tobias? Yeah. And uh, and and he will go into uh, the fields, uh, hopefully in the summer or or in the autumn, uh, with this pre analysis plan. So I think this is really an excellent opportunity uh, for for us, the audience, uh, but also for Tobias, to give uh, to give him some feedback on uh, uh, on a study that is still needs to be uh, that still needs to be executed. Uh, yeah, since we have a, uh, a short schedule today, I'll just keep to this. After Tobias, we'll have uh, Isabella Rebato, and when we get there, I'll, I'll say a bit more about her. But for now, Tobias, the virtual floor is all yours. Thank you. So, uh, hello everyone from my side. I'll just quickly share my presentation. And I think that should be working. Okay. So, um, uh, there we go. So, today I'm going to talk about using Think Alone protocol analysis um, to study candidate evaluation and gender. I have divided my talk into two sections of sort. So first I will introduce the Think Aloud framework and then kind of transition into presenting a study design. So this is part of the pre-analysis plan that Kais just mentioned to kind of showcase how I think the Think Aloud method can be applied in a concrete use case. So knowing what's going on inside what just has is of course one of the main goals of our discipline. But it's also notoriously difficult because how do we know really what's going on inside Roger's heads at a given moment? So this slide here shows an overview of the methodological toolbox um, that is used to address this kind of problem. And what I did is I very heuristically and subjectively grouped the most prominent approaches along two axes. So the first axis is the is directness and the directness with which a method accesses voters' thoughts, as in how much inferential work is needed to arrive at something that could be called a thought. Surveys are typically very direct uh, in that they capture voters' thoughts by asking them what they think of a given candidate or issue, and then we get something in return in numeric or textual form, and we call that a thought, period. Um, as a trade-off, however, we're often not very confident to what extent the information we get actually reflects the, inf the information we wanted to know in the first place. And this confidence in the obtained information represents this other axis, the x-axis. And here, uh, more implicit measures, so approaches that I put to the right of this dashed line um, are considered as providing more robust information that we can be more confident in. Uh, however, they are rarely direct. So let's say physiological measures, for example, skin conductance response measures, are, they, they don't really directly tap into voters' thoughts like surveys do, but um, instead they use some inferential framework to get there. So uh, skin conductance response is seen as a measure of arousal, which uh, is used as a, a measure of attention and so on, and we kind of approach a cognitive process from alongside this inferential chain. So what I'm going to do next is add the Think Aloud framework method 
to this toolbox by the, discussing it in terms of these two axes. Uh, in terms of directness, think alouts are, well, they're pretty direct, kind of like service. Participants are given a task and they're asked to think aloud as they solve that task. And um, so after quite some searching, I found like only a, half, a handful of studies which have explicitly implemented these think aloud tasks in the domain of political thinking. Like, for example, Schreiner and Bernstein used think alouds to study the way that students of political science use different information sources to develop a rhetorical argument for or against a, a specific policy position. Lask and Chad are, at least to my knowledge, the only study that used think alouds to explicitly uh, study candidate evaluation by having participants view and rate several images um, on different scales and so on. Um, so there's, in terms of directness, think alouds are similar to surveys, but they're also different in that we don't only get a single shot at voters' thoughts, we get a whole stream of thoughts. And this stream only really becomes meaningful if it's interpreted within an inferential framework. So um, Ericsson and Simon, the two, not fathers, but popularizers of the method, um, they kind of postulate that there is one big assumption that we kind of have to keep in mind. And this assumption is that the sequence of verbalizations on the report, so V1 to Vn, equates or at least approximates pretty well the sequence of information chunks that are being held in the working memory during the, proc uh, the process of task solving. So when people think aloud what they're actually doing according to this framework is they are continuously revealing uh, the information chunks that they're currently holding in their working memory. And this assumption, although it's kind of generic, has caused uh, quite a lot of frowning inside and outside the, the various different disciplines. And especially in psychology, the home discipline of the method, uh, there's been repeated methodological debate about what the method can and cannot do. And as a response, there's been quite some researching uh, on, on the capabilities of the method. And much of the critique has kind of revolved around two problems. So the first problem deals with the reactivity of the method. So whether the act of thinking aloud affects the task solving performance or not. And the second problem is uh, the validity. So whether or not the reported thoughts are a good or adequate representation of the cognitive process that the researchers claim to study with that method. The reactivity problem has been addressed by a meta-analysis of uh, 94 think aloud tasks, which were then compared to their respective silent conditions and without any think aloud. The dependent variable there was the task performance, which was measured in terms of task accuracy. So uh, the goodness of the solution, so to speak, and in terms of the speed at which uh, people perform their task. And the main finding was that thinking aloud does not affect the accuracy. And this finding actually holds true across different types of uh, tasks as well. However, it does significantly slow down the, the, the process solving, the task solving process. And while this might be a problem in some cases, I think in, in most cases where we deal, where we're interested in voters' thoughts, we're much more interested in the content and not so much in the speed at which they do their thinking. So this is not that problematic, I think. The validity problem is slightly trickier because it depends on the kinds of theoretical framework that are being used and it does depend on the kinds of uh, cognitive processes that are being studied. Here about a handful of studies have addressed this uh, issue specifically and they generally conclude that the method, it does yield valid data. Um, it just kind of really, there, there's this necessity to be very explicit and transparent about the kinds of inferences that are being made. We have to keep in mind that um, this is a explicit way of measuring thoughts. So there's no way around that. And what we're dealing with here are uh, thoughts or concepts that are available to participants as well. So before I transition to uh, 
So this transition now is kind of the, the point of this is to showcase how I think the think about method can be applied to study gendered candidate evaluations of uh, from, from media images. And in the literature on candidate evaluations and gender, the, the, the main question is always, is there a gender bias against women candidates? Um, and two recent meta-analyses of traditional vote choice candidate experiments kind of provide compelling evidence that voters are not systematically biased against women candidates. And while that's a relief to know, um, these findings might not directly be transferable to the context of media coverage because media more often than not are interested in creating interesting stories and generating attention and they do that not so much by using neutral images but by using very interesting images and on top of the image choice there's also other contextual confounders to worry about such as the the headlines, the titles, the article placement and content and so on. And these, these additional elements, I think, uh, may contribute to the way that candid images are being processed by, by people. So the reality of mediated candid images might look quite differently from the, the, the more neutral candid images that we look at in a controlled lab setting. So this is why I propose to kind of take a step back and approach this question from a think about perspective where we look at the, the voters' thoughts while they evaluate mediated women and men, men candidates. Before I present the study design, I'd like to make some theoretical clarifications or just some background. And my main idea is to embed the think about framework in Lodge and Tabor's dual process model of political evaluation. And in line with the model, I see the evaluation process as starting with an external event, which then triggers a series of unconscious processes such as yeah, hot cognition, effect priming, effect contagion, etc. And these unconscious processes then determine which mental concepts become available as considerations in the working memory. And they're available for further explicit processing. And these, these considerations are what, from a think about perspective, I would call thoughts. And I, I think of these thoughts as being this stream of activated concepts uh, that are available in the conscious working memory. And in line with Lodge and Tabor's model, these thoughts have both a semantic component, so they have a, a core content, what the thought is about, and they have a, an effective component, so a negative, positive, ambivalent kind of valence component. And lastly, I'm interested in evaluations, but less interested in the, the actual explicitly reported outcomes, such as the, a reported competence rating or vote choice, and I'm much more interested in how people rationalize these outcomes and how they actively make sense of their own evaluation. So based on this kind of background, uh, I'll present the study design. And this, uh, as Heis mentioned, this is a pre-analysis plan that I'm currently working on. So uh, the data collection is scheduled to begin later this fall. So there's still some time to incorporate feedback. If you have any suggestions, I'd be very happy to hear about them. And the, the design consists of two main think aloud tasks. So this slide here shows the first task. Uh, after a warm-up phase to familiarize participants with the Think About procedure, um, the first Think About task is for them to look at six candidate images and um, then think aloud about what, what, what that person in the image is like as a politician in real life. So um, participants here, they're instructed to be very accurate, very descriptive, uh, as they infer the political profile of the people in the images. So this, this first task kind of focuses on the, for, on, the, on the earlier part of the evaluation process and is interested in looking at what concepts are being activated in response to an event, so let's say a mediated kind of image. So the first two uh, research questions ask for differences in voters' thoughts when they evaluate women and men candidates 
and I look at these I look at these gender differences both in terms of semantic differences in vulture thoughts and also in affective differences as well. A well, research question two then tries to uh, inductively tease out differences between voters thoughts when they evaluate neutral images and when they evaluate contextually rich mediated images and for this comparison um, one set of women and, women and men kind of images that I'm showing uh, is more neutral kind of similar to a lab setting so no additional context information except the image itself and the two other sets are exploratory images that kind of mimic uh, actual media content. So um, these exploratory images follow what well, they're, they're kind of chosen based uh, from a set of about 10, set, uh, 10 exploratory sets and each participant sees two. And they follow this theoretical sampling logic where one theoretically interesting criterion from media coverage, let's say a, a headline, is chosen and explicitly foregrounded in these images. Uh, yeah, let's say sexist headlines, but it could also be candidate attractiveness, for example. After a filler task, uh, participants are then asked to perform a second think about task, which focuses on the, on the latter part of the evaluation process, so on the whole rationalization process. And in this task, participants look at five hypothetical races, kind of like in a conjoint experiment setting, where they see an image of a woman and a man candidate from the same set at the same time, and then they have to explicitly make a choice and uh, think aloud about why they prefer one candidate over the other. And so the, the main interest here, the research question three, is whether, and well, to assess how and whether, voters rationalize their preferences differently or similarly for women and men candidates. The procedure that ends with a follow-up interview and a brief questionnaire. As for the data analysis, um, we just looked at the time. Yeah, I'll be kind of quick about this. Um, the, the main goal is to use the, the raw text data from the verbal reports and further process it by means of qualitative and quantitative content analysis. Um, I, I combine these two approaches to really get a rich description of the evaluation process and of gendered aspects aspect in that process. And the, each analysis, each approach kind of addresses specific parts of the research questions. Uh, I can come back to this later if you have any questions on that. As a conclusion, I'd like to just kind of briefly recap some of the potential I see of, of think alouds um, for the study of political thought. So first and foremost, I think they think alouds are a valuable addition to the toolbox because on the one hand, um, they are super versatile in, time, in terms of the tasks that can be studied. Uh, but they're also versatile in, in, in the kinds of theoretical frameworks that they can work with and that they can accommodate. Uh, however, on the other hand, they're also very valuable because they generate rich process information. And this process information kind of opens up a lot of uh, avenues for different an analysis techniques, such as just raw text analysis uh, and more traditional content analytical approaches like what I'm doing. Um, I think this process information is also important because it kind of fits into this tendency to move away from only looking at outcomes and trying to understand the underlying processes and the, the causal mechanisms. And uh, while this process information is interesting in itself, it, I think the biggest payoff would be to combine it with uh, other data sources from physiological experiments or survey experiments to get this really uh, complete or comprehensive view of a cognitive process. So to leave enough time for answers, I'd like to finish here and I'm very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts and thank you very much for your attention. Hey.
Thank you, Tobias, for being on time. Um, so uh, there are already a couple of questions for you. Uh, so how it works is uh, um, uh, if you have questions, uh, write them in the Q&A box uh, and I'll read them uh, out loud. And then uh, you can think out loud, uh, Tobias. Um, so um, the first question is from uh, Amanda Friesen. Uh, uh, she says, uh, what a cool, project, cool method and project. Could you say more about why you're using known so politicians such as Merkel and Obama rather than less familiar politicians? Might there be confounds with familiarity, country of origin, etc.? Yeah, uh, I'd gladly answer that question. Actually, the, these images that I showed here, they're not part of the stimulus material. This might have caused some confusion. I could use these images to just, um, yeah, kind of set the context, basically. And I've seen that we had quite some international friends in the last lab meeting, so I wanted to have used these very known candidates. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm actually, um, in, in the neutral images, I'm, I'm only using unfamiliar candidates. And at least in one set of exploratory images, I will use more, I will use very known Swiss politicians um, to just have a very kind of qualitative insight into whether the familiarity or what changes in the evaluation process with uh, the familiarity aspect. But yeah, I agree with uh, you, Amanda, that only using uh, familiar candidates wouldn't work or wouldn't be as yield as interesting as results. Maybe it's a question of clarification for me, not from Amanda, but um, uh, if you show people unfamiliar politicians, you ask them to think aloud. Mm -hmm. Aside from, so you, you're using that to pick up the stereotypes and not evaluation of that politician, right? Yes. So the, the whole the whole concept is to, and this is kind of where the, where the, the project is very inductive, exploratory, um, by showing them unfamiliar candidates and asking them to think aloud about what these people look like as politicians, I'm interested in what concepts, what thoughts spontaneously pop to mind. So um, it could be that, for example, for women candidates, people try to, uh, or participants, they think of personality traits much more than policy, specific policy statements when they describe the politicians or when they infer the political profile of that person. And maybe for men candidates, this is just a naive assumption. Maybe they say things like, uh, yeah, uh, I think he's very big on military policy or whatever. Um, another question from Melissa Baker, I think. Uh, uh, from University of Nebraska. Uh, a question for you, Tobias. Is there a way to tease apart a person's already existing gender biases uh, um, and the gender biases that come to consideration when evaluating candidate images? This might be more of a directed bias uh, in the treatment groups. So does it matter for your study goals that to tease apart these two components? I think it does matter. Um, one idea was to Kind of pre-select for extreme people with uh, like extreme attitudes and some with lesser extreme attitudes, and then kind of see if there are any differences in, in how people evaluate or in how much gender reference they make. For example, gender-related thoughts they have. Um, I decided against that because it was kind of impractical for some for for different reasons. But what I'm going to do is add measures uh, that kind of look at gender identity and identification in the, in the post-treatment questionnaire to be able to at least kind of uh, control for that or, or run separate analyses to look whether there's something happening there. Okay. Uh, next question from uh, Marike van der Velde from also affiliated with the lab and working at the Free University. Uh, dear, dear Tobias, this is an ex it's a long question. I'll try to break it up for you. This is an exciting research plan. Uh, I think the approach of, uh, of Think Aloud is really innovative and gives us deeper insights into the black box of candidate evaluations. I have two questions about the implications of your design. Let's start with the first. You seem to suggest that in a Think Aloud task, you can tease out the content, which you call semantics from effective parts, 
There's plenty of lit, uh, literature amongst uh, others framing literature that shows that your connection to an issue or candidate steers the type of words you use to describe an item with. How will you deal with this? Okay, so we're starting with that question. Um, I think what I call the semantic component of a thought is um, kind of the, the mental concept that is being activated. And, and of course, the kinds of framing, the kinds of image framing that is being used has an influence on that, um, on the kinds of, con on, on the type of concepts that are activated. However, I think it's still interesting to see if that influence is there for all kinds of framing and design choices equally, whether basically people just react and focus on that one thing that is different. So for example, a headline, and then they all, they all they only talk about the, ha the headline or whether um, they kind of, they look at the headline, but then they focus on something else. And um, the, 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 the whole idea to really get a look into whether they, think of more uh, in terms of personality traits or policy statements, etc. I think that idea is still there. Um, second question, following up on Amanda, uh, why are you comparing candidates from two countries? Oh, that's been answered. Um, so that question we can move on and there are more questions. So we'll go to a question from Sonne van Oosten. Uh, Hi Tobias, it's a great presentation. I agree that Think Aloud can uh, open up a lot of possibilities. I have a question about social desirability. Um, sorry, do you think that this method will reduce or accept, accept, exacerbate social desirability bias? When people think aloud, will they be more or less prone to try to be social desirable? In that vein, do you know about the article by Krupnikov et al. in 2016, where they find that when people are offered the possibility to explain their answers, they're more prone to be more sexist and racist in their answers to candidate experiments. Anyways, excited to hear what you find after you've been into the field. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really fair point. And um, it's also one of those points that are routinely being discussed when people kind of approach think aloud in the literature. And um, there's different answers to that based on who you need, basically. One approach is saying that it's not better or worse in terms of social desirability as surveys, because we're basically dealing with explicit uh, measures, so they're all subject to social desirability influences. Another approach is saying that um, thinking aloud uses up so many cognitive resources that people are less available to still kind of have this social desirability normative filter going on in the back of their minds, but they're being actually more sincere and spontaneous in, in, their, in, their, in their verbalizations than when they have leisure, the leisure to think about what they're going to answer than just answer one thing. Those, the, those are the two kind of approaches. And I, I do know the studies, uh, the study that you cited, which is super interesting. And I have honestly not managed to kind of tie it in the theoretical part as of yet. Um, I, I do think it's something to keep in mind, that's for sure. Uh, next question is from Martin Roosma uh, from the University of Twente. Uh, he finds a super interesting uh, project. Um, he wonders uh, if you might have insights about the intercoder reliability with this method. I suppose that you use some sort of coding scheme for analyzing the thoughts of the think aloud. I'm curious what the categories uh, are and, and so basically can you tell us something about how to get reliable estimates out of this method? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so most most analysis methods to think about well of the verbal reports themselves, they use some sort of content analysis. Um, like I'm, I'm I come from a media presentation background, so this is like one of the bed of brother of our methodological toolbox kind of. Uh, but in psychology, a lot of times they would uh, have coding schemes which are very abstract and kind of code. Uh, let's say. Um, whether there's an evaluative statement or uh, uh, a logical connection or something like that. What I, in this concrete case, I'm planning on doing is um, capturing the, 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 the very basically the content core, so whether it's a reference to a policy 
or a reference to a personality trait or reference to a personal life. Um, and then capture the effect uh, by just having, having coders say it's negative or it's more a, 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 a positive thought as in this person looks like a good human being, for example, that would be positive. Um, as for intercoder reliability, I think it just requires the same kind of procedure and control where you have coder, um, coder training and continuous supervision. Um, it, the coding itself should not be that complex, so I think it should be doable. Okay, um, thank you. There are a couple smaller follow-up points, but that uh, you, you will get these from, uh, from Christian out of the Zoom archives. Uh, I want to thank you, Tobias. Uh, uh, I hope uh, that we'll also be able to meet you at some point in person, or at least uh, uh, I haven't met you in person in Amsterdam, uh, but uh, this is really exciting stuff. Um, now uh, we're going to go to Isabella and Gijs just announced he wanted to introduce Isabella, so I hand over the floor to uh, 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 to, to Gijs for the brief introduction. Yeah, um, Isabella, you the floor. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm uh, next speaker up is Isabella Rubasco, uh, PhD student in the Autolytic lab, um, uh, and, and uh, this is the first uh, first experiment. Experiment that comes out for the dissertation, and the results are very fresh. So, um, also as a co author on this paper, I'm, I'm very curious to hearing your um, responses to this. But first, uh, I give the floor to Isabella to present uh, the results in the design. Right. Um, just share my screen. Okay, thanks, guys. Um, yeah, as I said, this is the first paper of my dissertation. Um, it's I think a few of you have seen the pre-analysis plan and different uh, versions of the pre-test of this, so it's really exciting to be able to present the results to you. Um, the paper is now called "Politics of Pointing Fingers: How Appraisals of Certainty, Control, and Responsibility Shape Emotional Responses to Politics." And I think I can keep this part short. I don't think I have to do a lot of convincing to this audience that emotions are important to politics. They are used by politicians strategically to um, mobilize and, and um, persuade voters and to shape political judgment. And they do, in fact, mobilize and, and influence our political judgment and information speaking, for example. Um, and both in public discourse and in the literature, a lot of attention has been paid to the role of anger and fear in politics. And they have largely opposing consequences on political judgment. So for instance, anger mobilizes, it increases political participation, it makes us more biased um, information processors, it's involved in the process of motivated reasoning itself. Um, it leads to increased outgroup derogation and social polarization. Whereas fear does the opposite, it motivates deliberation and it makes us, you could say, more open-minded, it increases information um, seeking about politics. Now, why is this the case? Um, a lot of the studies that have been done are somewhat um, more or less loosely based on um, cognitive appraisal theories. And cognitive appraisal theories say that we evaluate situations based on six appraisals, pleasantness, anticipated effort, attentional activity, certainty, control, and responsibility. And before I explain what they are and, and how that works, um, the appraisal tendency framework then adds to that and argues that these appraisals are not only the causes, but also the consequences of emotions. So the way that we evaluate a situation influences our emotional state. And as long as we are in that emotional state, we um, we evaluate even unrelated situations after in line with the appraisals that cause the emotion or that are related to that emotion. So for instance, anger comes about when a situation is certain. So when we know or when we are certain about the causes and consequences of the situation, both anger and fear, um, I don't think I have to explain that too much, are unpleasant or come, come about from a situation that is unpleasant to us. Anger is also a high control emotion. 
So uh, control refers to the fact uh, or refers to an evaluation of, of uh, preventability, one could say. So whether we feel like we have or had control over the situation and how it developed or will develop. And last, other responsibility uh, refers to whether we can attribute responsibility to either ourselves or someone else. So um, in anger, responsibility is attributed or it comes from a situation where responsibility is attributed to someone else. If we, for example, attribute responsibility to ourselves, we feel shame. And fear has not only opposing consequences, as I said before, but also opposing causes. So fear is a, an uncertainty emotion, so it comes from an appraisal of low certainty and of low control over the situation. And responsibility, theoretically, should not necessarily um, play a role in, in um, fear responses. And from this framework, um, as I said, like it, these are not only the consequences, uh, the causes, but also the consequences. So, for example, uh, the fact that angry people are more biased um, reasoners could come from the fact that they already feel quite certain about their positions because it is a high certainty emotion, a social polarization that is a consequence of anger. Um, could be said to come from the appraisal of other responsibility and fear for example is an un is a high uncertainty emotion so we want to um, we want to increase a certainty about a topic that makes us anxious by seeking out more information now um, we can study the the consequences of anger and fear by for example experimentally inducing emotions and many have done so before me um, but the problem with that is it doesn't tell us anything about what makes us angry or anxious about political issues and why sometimes people feel angry and sometimes they feel anxious. Um, and we could also study it observationally here. The problem often is that anger and anxiety are highly correlated, which is a problem because theoretically we know that they should come from opposing appraisals and they also have opposing consequences. Another branch of literature has largely focused on blame as a cause for anger. But again, theoretically, we would assume that certainty and human control play a role just as much as responsibility attribution does. So in this paper, we want to find out how um, elites and how they speak about an issue can influence emotional responses to politics. Um, and specifically how appraisals of certainty, human control, and responsibility shape anger and anxiety responses, fear and anxiety used a bit interchangeably, um, to politics. And we use the, we, we borrow a bit the term um, of emotion frames from NABI, um, but we see emotion frames not only as a frame for how we perceive something else based on our own emotion, but also about something that can be put on a political message, whether that's a speech or a text by political elites, to influence emotional responses. And here we argue that if a text, for example, um, includes high certainty or emphasizes high certainty, emphasizes these appraisal dimensions, then this is an emotion frame that is intended to elicit certain emotions. Um, to study this, we have pre registered seven hypotheses. Uh, the first three are about the independent effects of the three appraisal dimensions. We expect that both uh, all three certainty, control, and responsibility increase anger responses. And we expected that anger is highest when certainty, control, and responsibility are high. And this is what we call an anger frame. And then we expected that high certainty decreases anxiety and that high control decreases anxiety or the inverse could be true that high uncertainty increases anxiety and and low human control or high situational control um, increases anxiety and that in an anxiety frame which is um, when both certainty and control are low anxiety is the highest we studied this um, in with in a survey experiment we pre-registered the the experiment, the hypotheses um, on the open science framework. And we had a sample of roughly 1800 respondents that were sampled by Dinata in the Netherlands. 
and to independently manipulate um, the three appraiser dimensions um, led us to a two by two by two factorial experiment. That meant that we had eight different frames and in each of them certainty, control and responsibility were either high or low. Um, in the case of responsibility, because responsibility doesn't matter for fear um, and we are not interested in shame in the study, responsibility is either present, so either a responsible actor is named or no responsible actor is named. And we did this in five experimental rounds on five different issues. The issues were um, vaccination or a decrease in vaccination rates and measles and polio outbreaks in the Netherlands, pesticide pollution of Dutch rivers, um, increasing painkiller addiction in the Netherlands, EU asylum policy and um, kind of the situation of, of more refugees again coming to Europe and the EU being unprepared and the COVID-19 pandemic. And the reason why we chose these issues were because they are largely bipartisan and the first three especially are not very salient. Um, the refugee uh, issue is clearly more salient and that was our salient issue and then we added the COVID-19 issue after um, as clearly then the most salient issue at the time. Uh, we collected this data about two weeks ago. Um, and then also we, it was important that these issues are largely bipartisan. So the first three are, I think, clearly bipartisan. Uh, the EU issue, we tried to make it bipartisan by only talking about how the EU is unprepared, but not giving any specific policies of how they should be prepared. Um, and and yeah, and the COVID-19 issue was more about the Dutch um, the Dutch response to the uh, to the pandemic. So it could be seen as more partisan, but um, we'll see how these issues differ later. The protocol was um, that we measured some basic demographics, political interests, knowledge and orientation. We included two attention checks and we excluded participants who failed them after warning, I should say. So we um, I gave them a bit of leeway and the 1800 respondents are the ones that passed the attention checks. And then they had five experimental rounds and in each round they were shown an information sheet on the issue. And then we measured emotional responses to that issue using the adapted um, PANAS measure where they where respondents select the emotions that they felt. These were presented in randomized orders and order and then only after they rate the intensity of the emotions that they selected in step one. Um, the experimental stimuli um, looked like this. They, it, had, it always had a title and a base sentence that were constant across um, conditions. This is the issue of vaccinations. And then they were shown three statements that were either high or low in the appraisal. And for example, in the certainty appraisal here, it either says, um, the high certainty statement says that um, the decreasing vaccination rates have led to a doubling of measles and polio cases and the low certainty um, manipulation said that it is unclear whether the two are related. And in practice, it looked like this. So they were very simple. Uh, we pre-tested them twice, once in Dutch and once in English. And after the first round, we added these questions to make it even more clear what these statements are about. And for the non-Dutch speakers, um, the questions are, what are the consequences? Um, is this preventable? And who is responsible? And then one of the treatments. Now, uh, let's get to the results. Um, the, this is the distribution of the dependent variable anger. Um, you can see the means per issue are between four and 10 on a 100 point scale. So they're very low and that is largely caused by the fact that there are many zero responses, which also you can see in this graph clearly. Um, but there is substantial variation nonetheless. And if we zoom in on the people who selected anger, 
um, we see that there is actually quite some variation in how they responded. And if they chose anger, then the mean um, of their intensity was, um, yeah, let's say around 35 overall. So the first task of this study, as I've mentioned before, was to try and manipulate anger and anxiety separately. Um, and I think we were able to do that quite well or surprisingly well, um, if, or it was, it was a surprise to us, um, because the two were either not correlated or negatively correlated, which is good for our further analysis. And to the results of hypothesis one, um, so here we hypothesized that each one of them, that each one of the three appraisal dimensions would influence anger responses. What we see, however, is that anger responses are largely driven by responsibility. Um, we find no effect of responsibility in the refugee issue, and I'm happy to talk about why I think that's the case. And same for certainty, we don't find any effects, but we do find an effect for the refugees issue. Control across all tests really there's no clear pattern how that affects emotional responses. Right, and what, uh, maybe one more thing, what you see here is by issue and then you see the pooled sample uh, in yellow. And then next we tested the anger frame, so that is when all three are high. And here we see again that yes, in the anger frame condition, the anger responses are higher than in the other con conditions, but if you look at the coefficients, the coefficients are about one third smaller than in, than in the past test, which leads us to believe that this is largely driven by responsibility and this in the end is just a bit of a messier estimate of the um, responsibility coefficient and that the others don't really do much and they definitely don't reinforce each other. So that's quite clear. And what about anxiety? Um, here, we did not have a hypothesis about responsibility. We hypothesized that both control and certainty would negatively influence anxiety. We only found find that for control and the corona issue, although that is probably not um, significant. And surprisingly, we did find that uh, responsibility negatively influences anxiety. So if responsibility is not mentioned, people are more likely to um, say they are anxious, whereas if um, responsibility is attributed to an actor, they are less likely to say they are anxious, more likely to say they are angry. And then what we find here too, again, for the refugees issue is that certainty increases anxiety, which is not what we expected, it's the opposite direction than we expected. Um, but again, happy to talk about that later. Um, and for the anxiety frame, we find pretty much the same the anxiety frame. So that is when certainty and control are high, doesn't really do anything um, and has a negative effect even um, during in the refugees issue. Now uh, to conclude, so we leave some time for questions. Um, we find that emotions are influenced by appraisals of politics, even on very salient issues, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, um, but that both anger and anxiety seem to be driven in opposite directions by responsibility attribution and not certainty and control. And that also this likely does not work on highly polarized issues, which is the refugees issue. And here I expect that the positive effect of certainty means that the, the emotions that we already have, whether that is fear or anger, are reinforced by high certainty on this particular issue because it's um, way more polarized and more um, salient than the other, but especially more polarized than, than the other issues. And that's it for me. And now I look forward to questions and comments. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Isabella. Um, there is already a first question. Um, first question is from Melissa. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, certainty of a cause versus certainty of an outcome and what this means for the role of anxiety or fear? 
The letter is a little bit outside of the appraisal theory that this project is couched in, but my intuition is that uncertainty about an outcome is going to lead to more effectively charged emotions and is definitely related to the five issues. So if I understand correctly, so we have a situation on the, the outcome of that so there's, the, I think the question, uh, let me rephrase a little bit. Um, can you elaborate a little bit about whether or not there's a distinction about the certainty of a, uh, a cause versus a certainty of an outcome and what this would imply for anxiety? I'm, I'm still not sure. So it's about the, the, the outcome of a situation. So we have an issue and the certainty about the causes or the certainty about the consequences. So Melissa's intuition is that uncertainty about an outcome is going to lead to more effectively charged emotions compared to uh, about uh, the certainty of a cause. That is possible, I'm not sure. So we did focus on what are the, about the consequences of a situation in this uh, survey experiment. So we, if you remember the, the questions that we had, it was what are the consequences? So we had a problem in the base sentence and what this could lead to or, or has led to. Um, we didn't actually manipulate the cause so much just because it was easier to stick to one. And this um, just seemed more intuitive in how we speak about political issues. I don't know if there would be a difference. I'm not sure if that answers the question. Um, other questions? Yes, there's a question from Patrick Stewart. This is wonderful research. Um, could you do a post hoc probing to consider whether there are differences based upon political ideology and sex and gender in the appraisal process, especially given research on emotional, emotional responses with both? What are your thoughts as to potential differences with either or both? I could do that. So what we did in this study, I didn't mention the controls that we used in all these analysis. So we did control for uh, political engagement and, and gender. And we find at least no consistent main effects of, um, of any of them. So sometimes we do find gender effects. Uh, find, I found, I, I'm not sure in which model, but some effects that were surprising to me that, oh, on the vaccination issue, women were more likely than men to report anger. Maybe that is because the issue is um, closer to some women, especially if they have children. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I think it would be extremely interesting to see how, um, how the appraisals differ or how, how the appraisals work differently by gender. Um, I haven't done it, but I, I could do that, yes. Could I, could you speculate what then the difference would be? Well, I think especially certainty would be an interesting one. So there's some work that suggests that women speak uh, with more uncertainty language. They are more uncertain or tend to be more uncertain. Um, so certainty could have a stronger effect for women if men tend to speak with more certainty or maybe potentially think with more certainty about political issues anyways, um, then maybe there's no effect there. That would be my only kind of ad hoc um, hypothesis. The other ones I'm not so sure. I mean, with responsibility, it could be stronger for men um, who are, tend to be more conflict seeking, less for women who tend to be more conflict avoidant. I think it would be really interesting to look at this. Okay. Um, next question from Marike van der Velde. Uh, happy to see the project with some data now. I have a question about the results in the front end of how you started the presentation. What are the implications of these findings for our understandings of politics or political evaluation? So I think now the literature is a bit split in either looking at um, at the elites or looking at the consequences, but we don't know much about how it translates. So I think the big implications are that we, when we study elites and we study um, how they use things like certainty in political speech, 
then we know the implications of that if we know that this actually has an effect on emotional responses. Okay, great. Um, next question from Martin Rosma. Hi Isabella, my compliments for the clear presentation of this project. My question links up to the previous one. I wonder if you uh, speak about certainty or, or control or certainty, who is the object? So for control, is, is this about control for the person that experiences the emotion or control by the person or organization held responsible or the control or some of some damage in society at large? I really like that you make such a good use of truly psychological theory on emotions, which few do in political psychology. I think that's a really good question. So the appraisal tendency framework, I think would say that even if the appraisal of the situation is not about my personal control, then what I value it after is about my personal control. So for example, a high control um, emotion like anger could influence, let's say political efficacy if I feel like I have control to change politics. So it translates from an appraisal of a different um, situation to the to my um, judgment of another um, of another situation, and then there was a different part of the oh yeah about control and responsibility um, or control and the other um, parts, right? Is that correct? Yeah. Um, so I think the null findings when it comes to control could have something to do with the fact that we we manipulated control as in do humans in general have control over this? And of course, if even if we say it's really hard to control this um, and there is situational control, there's no human control. If then right after in the next sentence we say there is responsibility, then I think often how people think about responsibility, there's an aspect of control in there. And especially if the trust, if they trust the information sheets that we give them, which we hope, um, then us saying that someone is responsible could also have an aspect of human control in them. So I think that is something that could explain the null findings with um, control. And I'm not super convinced that with a different setup, maybe you would find, or I am um, not super convinced that in any setup you wouldn't find an effect for control. Um, I think a lot of what we know about the consequences of anger suggests that human, that control does play a role. But I think if you mention responsibility in kind of the same, um, um, in the same, or in the setup, if you have control and responsibility, then control might be a bit overshadowed by responsibility. Uh, thank you. I think that was the last question. Uh, is, could you turn off the sound, Isabella? I hear a little bit of an echo. Um, oh wait, are there still? No, these are the last questions. So, uh, with the last questions, uh, this also means that uh, uh, the last uh, session of the Hot Politics Lab in this academic year comes to an end. Uh, I must admit, and I'm pretty sure that I speak to anybody affiliated with this lab, that I did not anticipate uh, this uh, to uh, this academic year to develop as it did develop. Um, uh, I must say that uh, moving the lab online, at least for my perspective, uh, has actually enriched the experience that we can have because it's uh, it has broadened the people that can both uh, participate and the people that can present. Uh, also, on an, uh, and, and our ecological footprint also is uh, relatively limited. So, uh, that said, um, uh, the, the pandemic has brought a lot of bad things, uh, but uh, I think for the lab it has also uh, created a new dimension that we would have probably otherwise did not start. As it looks uh, uh, today, um, it's, uh, we will continue this uh, for the next semester online um, uh, and in the format that you uh, are used to, and we're um, we're setting up a speaker series for the fall um, with um, the only confirmed speaker that just came in is uh, Stephen Webster, a new, newly minted assistant professor at, the, at Indiana University who has uh, a forthcoming book on anger in politics, uh, but will, uh, as you are used from us, will sample from communication scientists, political scientists, psychologists, and other people that do work that speaks to our work uh, to come and talk in the lab. 
Uh, I hope that all of you take a little bit of a summer break because uh, at least when I speak for myself, I've been dragging myself to the end of this, uh, of this month and uh, so that we can fresh, uh, with, with fresh energy and uh, renewed uh, ideas can start a new academic year, uh, August 28th. Uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all then, uh, at least in this digital world again. Thank you very much.